Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first ever Spring Grain Market Outlook conference from AHDB Market Intelligence. My name is David Udall, and I head up the team of arable market analysts, of which you're going to hear from shortly. And we have the whole team on the call today. Um, in our October outlook, we highlighted the risk that La Nina posed for South American crops, and we're still feeling the effects of uh, weather upon soybean and corn crops um, in Brazil and Argentina at the moment, and the likelihood of a move to barley in animal feed rations at the expense of wheat, and we've seen that in the recent um, balance sheet that we produced, as well as a reduction in oilseed rape area for harvest 2021. So over the five months since we last presented our grain market outlook, we've seen prices rapidly gain as uh, global stocks have dwindled in the face of um, quite voracious Chinese import demand and unfavorable weather in key producing regions. So the question is, where do we go from here? And that is the reason why we are here today, to have more of a discussion on what could drive markets going forwards. And all of the information that um, we're going to present today and discuss is already available in the handouts section of the webinar. As ever, the feedback that you can provide on what we do is really critical to ensure that we provide value for the levy. And once the webinar is complete, a feedback link will pop up. And I can't say how important it is that you all complete this so we can continue to improve our information in the future. Uh, likewise, we're always open to discuss what we do and our contact details are at the bottom of all of the emails that we send out. So if you have a question on what we're producing, do feel free to get into contact with our analysts. So Helen, if I could just ask you to move to the next slide, and um, we've just got a few housekeeping points to go through. Uh, I've just asked you to um, ensure that um, you ask any questions. We have the question capability in the um, GoToWebinar function that we're using today. Um, we're going to be going through about a 20 minute session talking about global markets at the start, and then we'll be pausing for some questions to review that. Then we'll be handing over to a second session where we're looking more at business performance and the longer term impacts of um, changing um, direct payments and changing policy and a bit of a direction on input prices as well. And again, we've got time for questions. We've got a lot of time to have a discussion today, so please answer any questions that you have. Any questions that we miss, we'll then take away and we'll be um, coming back with answers to those in the coming days in the publications that we produce and also um, on social media and on videos as well. So I'll begin by handing over to our senior analyst, Helen Plant, to start the discussion on global and domestic markets. Helen and the team, it's over to you. Hi, thank you, David. Roll on, ready? Okay, fab. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. Um, as David said, prices have risen uh, quite sharply since October. We've now got ex-farm feed wheat prices in excess of £200 per ton and delivered rate seed prices um, over £450 per ton. And as David said, one of the key things that's kind of pushed that up has been adverse weather in South America. And Antti, I know that's something you've been looking at recently. Uh, yes, Helen. Well, as uh, David mentioned at the start, um, we've had a moderate La Nina this season, which has affected um, South America significantly um, throughout November to about January. So this has actually brought quite a lot of dry weather. So this was in the moment when uh, Brazil and Argentina would have been planting their uh, soybean and maize crops. So because development um, was late of these crops, you're actually seeing the large soybean crop that Brazil are going to produce um, harvestings behind schedule. It's further behind schedule as well because of the ongoing uh, rain in Brazil at the moment. So it's providing this um, support to markets as this, um, this crop comes to the export market um, late. And in uh, Argentina as well, there's been ongoing uh, dry weather, which is having significant impacts on their, uh, the yield um, of their soybean crop that um, they are going to be harvesting soon as well. But a key point to note with this, um, soybean crop that Brazil are producing is the off-season safrina maize crop will replace this soybean crop which is currently being delayed so this is a significant amount of maize which will go into the global balance sheet and actually export it so this is a key watch point over the next few weeks and months that Brazil managed to uh, harvest their soybean crop and to ensure that the area that Conab have predicted for the safrina crop actually goes into the ground. Yeah, so the, the soybean crop is being harvested now, so it won't be that long, I guess, before we get a feel for the final sort of 
I still have a feel for the numbers of the size of those crops, but for the May, as you say, these crops aren't going to be harvested until June, July time. So that's going to be rumbling for a while yet. So we, in terms of potential support or pressure on the um, the maize market, that's going to be running a bit. Uh, one of the other key things that we've seen a lot this season in terms of support for prices has been the demand from China. Um, what's the outlook there? Yeah, so as uh, everybody will know that markets have been significantly supported um we've had this agricultural commodity boom of chinese purchasing and obviously um their pig population was decimated by the african swine fever uh, a few years back and we are seeing china now purchase a significant amount of grains and oil seeds as we can see in the graph here we're way ahead of the five-year range and the five-year average so this is to actually to feed their their pig herd which they are um rebuilding but this also going into the next marketing year we are expecting to see this demand continue as there's going to, there's large structural changes um in chinese pig farming so it's changing more it's changing from a traditional uh, small scale farming that uses food waste for for uh, livestock feed to more high protein feeds and there's also expansion within chinese uh, the poultry sector as well which will increase their growth um for fees so in the going into the next marketing year we can expect that they're rebuilding a pig population for this to continue to sustain this population as well yeah that's a good point really because then I, I suppose that's what's feeding into the sort of early long range forecast that we've seen from the likes of the igc and the usda their sort of five and ten year outlooks they're still pointing to strong import demand from China, at least into next year and potentially longer. So while it's a difficult one in some circumstances because it, um, the visibility of those numbers and what's happening in the country isn't as great as other countries, it does seem like this is set to rumble for some time yet, potentially. And I think another quite important factor at the moment as well, Helen, is the Russian intervention. So obviously at the end of last year, the Russians announced that they were planning on implementing a wheat export tax uh, from the 15th of February. The idea behind this tax was to keep wheat in the country and therefore uh, prevent rising domestic food prices during this pandemic. Um, they then announced that from the 1st of March to the end of the season, this tax would actually double to 50 euro per tonne. And then going into new crops, so from the 2nd of June, it was changing to a formula-based tax, which would be calculated at 70% of the difference between the base price of wheat per tonne and $200. So when the price of wheat goes up, so does the tax. And this is to try to prevent any incentive for Russian farmers to carry old crop wheat over into new crop. Um, and this had a couple of impacts. So firstly, there was a big push to get wheat exports out the country before this tax came into play. So I think it's estimated that about 3.3 million tonnes was exported in January. If this is right, this is like 57% higher than last year, last January. And it's also likely to impact spring plantings. So spring wheat accounts for about a quarter of total wheat area. And Sobacon have said that this could reduce their production forecast by up to 2 million tonnes. So we've got a picture where we're seeing the Russians not only producing less wheat, but also it's going to be a lot more tied up uh, within their country and therefore less easily accessible on the global market in the new season. Yeah, and we're also seeing revisions down before all this on the, the Russian production. Anyway, obviously they've come off. A huge crop last year for 2020 but as weather goes in russia at the moment there's been mild amount of uh, winter damage in the volga region of, of russia but this is something that happens um every single year you know there's, there's an element of winter kill um within this area of the world okay yeah no it's a very good point and it's something we're going to need to keep an eye on isn't it? but that actually feels like a really good point to talk about what's happening with new crop and i've just popped um, the prices on the screen there sort of showing how the current new crop prices are comparing to what we've seen over the last 10 years or so for grain. Um, yeah, so I mean, what are you guys picking up? What are you seeing? In um, new crop? Well, 
I heard a couple weeks ago, a week or so ago, that Australia are forecasting their production to decrease by 25% of this new crop. Uh, obviously, it's important to note that they sort of were up there with record production levels this year. So that 25% reduction is more of just a move back in line with uh, average production levels. Um, the reason for this is the La Nina we've mentioned has uh, caused quite a lot of wet weather in Australia over the past few weeks, um, which is anticipated to hamper both area and yields. Um, it is important to note that um, there isn't actually any wheat in the ground in Australia yet. So at the moment, I'd say it's probably just more of a watch point to keep an eye out for. Yeah, definitely. The, the rainfall from now until May, so the end of the, the Australian autumn, will be a, a key watch point as well to, to dictate possibly what the area could be for, for this crop. But elsewhere in the EU, we are actually seeing uh, a re in EU 27 production, we're seeing a, a rebound for, for wheat. So obviously, notably the resurgence has come from France, who obviously suffered the, or a lot of Western uh, Europe suffered the wet autumn we did in, in 2019, which led to a large reduction in area, thus production. So we've seen a resurgence in that and, and ending stocks for next year are likely to increase. Weather in the moment for these crops in Eastern Europe is, is faring quite well. There was, there was a cold spell, as we know, as we had in the UK, a significant amount of snow. But that the, the damage to these crops has been limited and there's just been pockets of winter damage. But other than that, it, um, it seems to be very good. And, and like as we mentioned earlier in Russia as well, there's been pockets of, of, of damage there, but uh, nothing too concerning at the moment. So in the US, um, we actually saw the area for wheat is, is increased by 5% on, on uh, the previous year, but obviously last year was uh, significantly low. And this has been a reaction to the high prices, which we've seen, as you know, as we've mentioned, what's been driving this market at the moment. Um, again, there was a cold snap over uh, North America a few weeks back. We haven't got significant data on what the impacts of this could be. But going into April, we will receive the crop condition reports uh, from the, the USDA, which, which will provide an insight into what uh, damages possibly could have entailed, if it did entail any at all. Um, but as for, as for rapeseed, I know domestically our area is, is down year on year. And um, our market always trades at import parity, but it's, it's something that we still need to to obviously discussing and global fundamentals uh, will be key to uh, what our growers and uh, farmers receive for, for their ex farm values. So on a continental level, the EU uh, production, so strategy grains oil seed reports, uh, preliminary forecast is the production is going to increase to 17.1 million tonnes year on year from 16.1 um, last year. They're suggesting stocks could reduce for next year too as uh, uh, good crush margins, you know, increased crushing and the demand for, for biofuels as well. So the balance for EU rapeseed is looking tight for next year too. And as we know, the, U, the U, EU uh, usually turns to the Ukraine, Canada and Australia to fulfil uh, um, a deficit. And depending on what year and the outlook will depend on where prices go in the second half of the season. So oilseed rape here in the Ukraine is forecast down for next year at the moment. Um, preliminary forecast for Canadian uh, canola for the area by the Canadian government is uh, forecast up. So this is a reaction to, again, the high prices that we are seeing in the canola futures as well, which have rallied successively over the last few weeks. But again, I don't mean to be going on about weather, but the soil moisture deficit in the Canadian prairies is definitely a watch point over the next uh, couple of months as well, which, which will have an influence on the area that is planted for, for their canola crop. So in Australia, um, their crop will fulfil a lot of um, EU demand. So obviously we've had the moderate La Nina, which, is, which has brought rains and fantastic yields this year, and uh, Australia have had a fantastic production. But for next year, the they're predicting the area to increase, but yields to not be as good. So production for next year for Australian canola is not going to uh, be as large as the crop that we have seen this year, which it has been colossal. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's all good. Thank you. And, and so from what you've been saying and pulling all of that together then, it sounds like we're, it kind of plays into the prices that we've got on screen that for rapeseed, actually new crop prices are still pretty high in the 10 year range. Um, whereas, or, and sorry, as well but we'll come on to that in a second but looking at the european prices and uk prices reported more compared to global ranges than um in the states and so on um so that's actually a good point to move on then to go and say well actually the all of this for wheat and for rapeseed operates against a backdrop of maize and soybean and yes we've got the american crops coming but after that we're going to be looking to States and what is happening with those crops and we've recently had some news out of USDA Outlook Forum which was quite interesting wasn't it? Yeah so um, the pricing ratio in the US between uh, maize and soybeans will, will set the tone for growers intentions which will be happening in the next or well, the next month um, so the pricing relation between the NOF 21 uh, soybean contract and the December 21 maize contract. So at the minute, it's actually favouring soybeans. You know, it's nearly it was at 2.4 times um, the price of maize. So the price ratio is. And in the USDA, as you mentioned, Helen, the Outlook Forum um, a, a month back or a few weeks back, uh, we actually saw the soybean area significantly increase. I, I believe it's the second largest um, area that's been intended to be sown and we've also seen an increase in the maize area too but we um despite all of this the usda this large area increase which will inherently if, if planted and goes well will lead to a large production stocks for next season are not forecast to increase significantly because of this because we are still expecting to see a large demand within this global market for the next marketing um year as well but as we receive further information from the usda at the end of this month, there will be um, another survey that goes out on the intentions, and this will just uh, confirm that the soybean area is 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 going to be significant for for this marketing year, for the next marketing year as well. Yeah, potentially we'll have to wait and see what the USDA forecast, but I think that's yeah. definitely the expectation, isn't it, that they will uh, back up their earlier forecast. For me, out of all of that key thing is this expectation that US stocks are only going to increase a little bit despite these very big and potentially then very big crop, uh, big areas and big crops potentially um, in 21-22 season. And when we look at that against a backdrop of tight stocks amongst major exporters that have been run down this season, if we saw a similar pattern across the world, which while we've still got a lot of weather to happen, at this point in the year, you can only kind of go, well, it, assume average effectively. It seems that that sort of pattern could be replicated. And so we could be looking at another tight season next year um, around the major exporters and potentially around the world. Yeah, and Helen, I think that's an interesting point. And it's probably a similar picture to see that we're probably going to see in the UK as well. We obviously had a very small harvest this year. Production was below 10 million tonnes. It was the smallest harvest in 40 years. And because of this, when it came to forecasting our November balance sheet, where we'd usually have a surplus available for export or free stock, for the first time ever, we had a deficit indicating tightness. Since then, a lot's changed. The market really has done its job properly. The price of feed, the premium feed wheat over feed barley has just increased, increased up to almost 55 pounds a tonne at one stage. And this has really shifted a lot of animal feed demand away from wheat and into barley. We've heard compounders saying they're using barley at levels that has never been seen before. And maize has also actually picked up some of this demand as well. And then this lockdown three, it's killed uh, quite a lot of demand for milling wheat as well. So the demand situation from the previous forecast has changed. And then, so when it came to looking at our February estimate, we did actually manage to identify a small surplus. It said by the time we'd taken off what we'd exported to the end of December, we were back with a little deficit again. So it's looking like it's going to be very minimal carryover stocks that we take with us into the crop. 
and looking at the BPS area, the early bird area figure, we might have a half production of 14 and a half million tons. So supplies not looking huge and it's beginning to feel a bit tight actually into new crop. And we've seen our futures uh, contracts react to this. May had been a significant and ever increasing premium over November throughout this season. It reached almost a £45 premium back in the middle of January. However, since then, we've actually started to see these uh, contracts converge. And it's been very much May coming down to NOV rather than NOV moving up, which indicates the tighter feeling of supply for new crop than old crop. And we've actually also seen similar with our UK futures relationship to Paris futures. Normally, we're at a fairly good discounts to Paris, one of these reasons being that we are pricing off the feed wheat specification, whereas Paris is based as a milling wheat specification. However, we've seen our November contract moving up ever closer to their December contract. I think at the moment we're maybe at a two or three pounds uh, discount. So this shows that our market is trying to price itself to limit new crop exports and try and keep as much wheat in the country. And what I'd say, probably one of the biggest factors to this uh, sudden tighter feeling of supply that we're now feeling for new crop is the government announcement of E10. So increased biofuels in petrol, they announced it a couple of weeks ago. So we've got two biofuel plants in the UK. We've got Ensus, which has been running pretty much on wheat, uh, May, sorry, this season. That's due, just due to its price and availability in the North of England this season. But it, we're pretty sure that once new crop comes online, we will see it swap back to wheat again. Um, and then we've obviously got the Virgo, which has been offline for a couple of years now. And after this E10 announcement, they said they were going to fire back up again and hoping to have production starting by early 2022. So in time for the second half of new crop. So the picture has changed slightly. I'd say we're looking at minimal carryover, uh, probably quite average production, although there is a little way to go for that. And then now suddenly a large chunk of demand in the north of England that we probably hadn't anticipated. And that's going to mix things up um, from both a, a, a practical point of view and it's going to have implications on price as well, um, supporting likely premiums in the northeast of England but then having inverse effects for those furthest east and south where normally we try and export. Um, and we could see situations which we saw a few years ago where that was, was getting very difficult then. Okay, just mindful of time, I'm going to draw that together. I've put sort of a few key messages on the screen there, but for me, the sort of take home from everything we've talked about today is that we are potentially looking at a continuation of tight supplies um, both globally and uh, in the UK in the next season. That's dependent on, uh, largely dependent on what happens in China from a global point of view in terms of global demand and uh, from the UK around uh, ethanol demand as well. The one thing I will say though is there is still a lot of weather to happen between now and harvest and that could change things and from UK perspective our next that we get will be early April with our next crop report and at that point I'd like to pull that together and open up questions can David. Great thanks guys that was really interesting we've already had some questions come through so if anyone has any questions on anything that we've just gone through there then feel free to um, add them in. Um, I think Helen if it's okay I'll come to you first because we've had a couple of questions um, come through from when we were talking about um, global markets asking about the role that investment funds have played in recent times um, and um, I'm kind of sort of combining a few questions together here but I think the general tone of them is just asking you know with the role that investment funds have played over the past um, three or four months have they moved markets higher than we would have seen otherwise? Potentially I mean with Funds have definitely bought in. They've bought into the market um, across the three main US ones, but particularly maize and soya beans. Uh, I think reflecting the issue, the weather concerns in South America as they came in and the demand from China. With the funds quite often, when they come in, it can 
and it more that it can add to the speed of a rally, the, the speed at which prices rise or to an extent the amount they rise. But longer term, we see the supply and demand factors being the bigger issue for prices. So if they add um, almost overextend in the short term, there'll be a correction later and it things settle down again. But they are still bought into those markets. And that is a risk that when we look ahead, if there was some positive news about supply or slacking of demand, we could see those funds almost react the other way and um, use some of those positions uh, to minimise losses in the short term. And in the short term, that could add additional speed or pressure to prices. Cool. Thanks, Helen. Um, so I've got a couple of other questions here. Um, first one. Um, from Graham Gibson, who has asked, um, do you see barley staying at such a discount to wheat? Um, I'm assuming we're talking about the, the end of this season and then into into new crop as well. I don't know if we have a, a view on that. Barley's discount to wheat. Or is it wheat's um, premium uh, to barley? Um, one thing I'd say on that is if you look at the deliver, our delivered survey for um, New, well, November at the moment, we've got a feed wheat price for the Avon range at 174 delivered, and for the same month, barley is at 158. So that's what a 16 pound discount. So it uh, looks like there will be much a much smaller discount into new crop. Um, I guess it remains to be seen how, how it'll price for the rest of the season. It doesn't show much signs of narrowing the discount for the remainder of the season but yeah it's certainly thinking to new crop will see less of a discount but obviously it's important to remember that in the low teens barley is still a good alternative to wheat it does price itself so at 16 pounds it's still going to be favorable compared to wheat yeah great Thanks. sorry helen Karen. i was only going to add that the the area indications are that we could still have a decent a large barley area next year so we've got a little bit to go on that to see how um the wheat and barley price off each other because the the air the expectation is we could still have a decent um barley crop next year sorry sorry i don't know what that was apologies for that bit of uh cross-contamination from uh, another feed somewhere, but that's all right. Um, so I'll uh, go to another couple of questions. Um, we've had a couple um, from the um, topic that you mentioned, Toma, around um, ethanol. And um, I'll go to one of the first questions that came through from Pete Collins, um, which was asking regarding the UK ethanol market, um, what are our thoughts on what the potential usage will be for the next season? Um, and um, with the prices being so high at the moment, um, it sounds a bit strange for uh, to reopen a, an ethanol plant during a bullish market, and, and what are the reasons behind that? So I guess you know, probably m m just a bit of a deeper thought into what the, the the ethanol prospects are for the coming season. Yeah, I guess I couldn't really put a figure on how much they'll use, except for it's likely to be more than the last couple of seasons. Um, with regards to why they would do it in a bull market, I agree. It does seem an interesting time to open it when the price of raw materials is so high. Um, but obviously with the announcement of E10, I guess this means there's suddenly a lot more demand. And then there's also been a change to the nuts to regulation. Um, I don't know if Helen, you can help me out with the finer details on this, but I believe it means they get more of a tax break from the government or something to use wheat. To produce bioethanol? Yeah, so the um it's an, in short, it's a there's been a recalculation of what greenhouse gas emission savings can be offered by using wheat from certain parts of the UK. And there's a lot that goes behind that, but the short is it does make um it more attractive as a fuel source and so more attractive in terms of what they can uh, in tax purposes. And I think it was the equivalent, was it about 350,000 cars coming off the road, the equivalent? Um, right with the, oh, that was easy, sorry. Um, but the nuts too, again, feeding in offers a benefit, um, that side of things. And I would also say it comes down to the price that's achievable for ethanol as well as the price of the input. It's all about the margin. 
if the ethanol price that they can achieve is good, it almost doesn't matter that the input price is is higher. Um, and we saw that a few years ago as well. Great, thanks guys. Um, I'll ask one more question before we move on to the next um, section. Um, and I'll, I'll come to you, Anthony, for, for this one. Um, you mentioned um, the impact of um, La Nina and um, sort of the view of South American crops at the moment. Um, there's been a couple of questions come through that just say that the, the weather forecasts have changed a little bit um, in, in recent days and there's a lot more rainfall coming into some parts of um, South American regions. And is it is it too late for that rain or will that rain save any of the crop and what the, what the impact of the market um, will be? Um, well, there's some news that came out at the start of this week on um, Argentina and their soybean crop. So with it, they're forecasting that within the next 10 days, Argentina needs a significant amount of rain um, to save their soybean crops. Um, or they risk in their soy, their soy belt a yield loss of up to 30%. And as for Brazil, obviously the rains at the moment are significantly delaying harvest, uh, notably in central western regions of Brazil that should be near, especially in the Mato Grosso region, should be nearly done with their soybean harvest and they're not. But the rains will um, benefit the eastern regions of Brazil, which usually plant their crop later on and thus they will be further behind on the development. But to, yeah, so as, as crops go, the rains will not help the west of Brazil, but they'll help the east and they are much needed in uh, Argentina because the dry weather at the moment is really having large implications on, on what their yield could be for soybeans. Great. Cheers for that, guys. Um, thank you so much for that. I'm going to call the question session to an end there and we'll move on to the second section. So Helen, Anthony, Toma, thank you so much for, for kicking off and going through the, the global and domestic markets. Um, you guys will be back um, at the end if there's any other specific questions. Um, there was a few questions that we didn't have time to go through. Um, there was a couple regarding um, the impact of currency on market, which we might go through in the second section. So I'll, I'll hold those um, till a little bit later on. Um, but um, for you three guys, thank you so much for taking part. If I could ask um, James, Vicky, uh, Alex and Megan to join and we will kick off the second section looking at the impact on um, the overall business and how what's happening in policy and um, inputs affects farm decisions. So I'll leave it over to you guys. Thank you. Excellent. So uh, hopefully you can you can see my screen now. Um, so thanks for that. We're now going to have a look at, like David said, how we can apply the uh, global and domestic supply and demand situation into more of a business context. So over the next 20 or 30 minutes, we'll look at uh, the path of prices a little bit more, as, as we've just heard, just in terms of how that's going to play into margins over the course of the next year. Um, we'll also have a bit of a discussion around input costs and then we'll look at how that plays into uh, setting out a bit of a marketing plan and uh, ways to mitigate risk. Also, we're going to have a bit of a discussion around some of the shifts in uh, farm policy and the shift from the basic payment scheme towards the environmental land management scheme. So I'll start by just handing over to Alex and Alex, if you want to give us a quick sort of overview of where prices uh, are likely to be heading in the next sort of six to 12 months. Yep, so uh, morning everyone. Uh, we see the, uh, starting off with wheat, um, we see the kind of the new crop market here quite bullish, um, as you can kind of see by that uh, that small dial there. Um, if we if we look at the fundamentals, um, as we've just heard really, uh, we've had a sub 10 million tonne crop that equates to a lot less wheat to kind of carry over into, into the new season. Um, as Thomas spoke about, our latest balance sheet estimates kind of estimate a 73,000 tonne carryover, which kind of pales in comparison to the 2 million plus tonnes that we've seen in 2019-20. In um, add to this an ex kind of an expectedly average production figure for the, for the wheat crop come August. Um, if we multiply kind of the intended area really against average yields, it's likely sitting in that 14 to 15 million tonne range. Um, and without this kind of large carry-in, it means that the UK will then have to kind of look to import. So we'll likely be a, a net import next season. Um, so then because of that, global grain markets, European wheat prices are all kind of big watch points for price direction next season. They will kind of start to come into it quite a bit more. Um, 
UK wheat markets could see a, a large price price difference start to open up between kind of the north and north of England and other regions. Really, um, this will kind of come in the form of higher delivered premiums, kind of creating an incentive for for feed wheat to remain or to kind of travel up to the north of England. Um, well, why is this? Well, because as as Thomas spoke about last week, the the government announced E10 fuel would be in UK petrol stations by September this year. Um, E10 basically means 10% of the petrol is made from bioethanol and those two UK bioethanol plants uh, that Thomas spoke around are both kind of located in the north of England. So incre increased wheat usage for this sector will really kind of impact on wheat availability. Um, quickly to kind of move on to rapeseed now, rapeseed markets next season, they're looking to, quite, uh, looking to be quite bullish um, as you can see by the dial there. Uh, the factors for price support really are starting to form at the moment. Um, we know that the domestic rapeseed area is is down, and if intentions are, uh, if they are kind of intentions are planted at 312,000 hectares, this would kind of be the smallest rapeseed area since 1986. Um, Though most fields at the moment are kind of reportedly coming out of winter, looking quite well, um, we are starting to kind of get into this upcoming feeding period for the cabbage stem flea beetle, so that could kind of start to hit some fields quite hard. Um, and we'll see what happens there. Um, on, the, on the continent, as Anthony spoke about earlier, the supply outlook for rapeseed is looking quite tight. Um, high, crossing, high crushing usage will mean another 6 million tonne import requirement for the EU. This will really kind of help prices along. Um, and whilst the global, yes, the global oilseed market is a predominant driver for domestic prices, crop conditions for the EU 27 and also for Ukrainian rapeseed crop as well, they will really start to feed into the immediate price direction coming up for the next season. Um, those are uh, those are kind of watch points at the moment, really. Um, for barley markets, barley markets domestically are looking a little bearish this season for next season. Sorry, uh, though planted areas likely to have declined. A seven million tons, a seven million ton plus production figure could still occur, and it's quite likely. Um, we're expecting barley feed demand to also ease back from this season, as Thomas spoke around. It's quite high at the moment. Barley inclusion in feed manufacturing feed manufacturing sorry is up 38 percent in the season to january um, and better wheat availability next season will basically just cause this to kind of fall back um, depending on price um, one question mark as well for demand comes from the the brewing malting and distilling sectors um, usage this season into january is back 13.4 percent and that's coming from the hospitality closures as we know about um this this will start to kind of pick up in the new season we have that date in the diary of the 21st of june for the end of, for the end of restrictions but a longer term picture kind of comes from this changed landscape um in a cga survey that was released last month 31 percent of business leaders in the hospitality industry had sites across their portfolio that would remain closed um on the flip side 58 percent of those surveys were also expecting to open sites in the in the in the coming year really um but it's yeah, it's, it's kind of a, it's one to watch really. Um, the pace of exports as well of feed barley next season will be a key driver in price direction as well. You know, if there is kind of this large surplus in availability, getting that out of the country will start to ease a lot of pressure on prices, similar to kind of the last couple of seasons. Um, next slide, and we can kind of take a look at some outlooks for input prices. So I'll start off with fuel and then I'll pass over to James for kind of the, the fertilizer and also for interest rates. Um, as we know, red diesel prices, they track movements in crude oil markets. At the moment, crude oil markets are quite bullish. Um, these are, this is kind of supported by production cuts made by the OPEC Plus group. Um, for those of you who, do, who don't know, OPEC Plus are basically just a club of the nations that all kind of produce crude oil and export it. Um, they hold monthly meetings with the next one scheduled for April. And this April meeting could start to see the production cuts that are in place start to gradually kind of uh, be re reintroduced. Basically, it all kind of centers on global infection rates because that is basically a, a reflection of demand. Um, the, the spring drilling campaign at the moment for the UK will likely kind of experience red diesel prices that are high, kind of picking up really with a month to go because of this next OPEC meeting in April. Longer term, the outlook will entirely depend on the global recovery from from the from from the pandemic. Sorry, over to you, James, for fertilizer. Uh, so, fertilizer prices would be no surprise to anyone have come from um, a very or well, relatively low base, uh, sort of October time last year, and then in the last three to three to six months, have really accelerated away. 
Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. The, the often touted one is the uh, increase in energy prices and in particular natural gas prices. Um, and we have seen that to, to an extent. We've certainly seen those natural gas prices rise, but we've done some work recently looking at the relationship as well between crop prices and the price of fertilizer. And the relationship there is certainly much stronger. So that can start to give us a bit of an indication of where we might see uh, fertilizer prices go. We've already heard from, from Helen, um, Tom and Ant that we're, we're likely to see some, some tighter markets next year. Uh, and particularly if this Chinese demand continues, then um, corn price is very, very likely to stay strong. Uh, if we take that price uh, a proxy for the area or certainly the demand overall for fertilizer, then we can see why fertilizer prices could also be relatively strong next year. Uh, we're coming into a period of strong demand now. We're going to have some big plantings in the US, as, as we've mentioned already, um, and combine that with the cost of energy and, and increases um, elsewhere, and uh, also the potential for, for reduced interest rates. And we, we could well see, uh, reduced exchange rates rather, we could well see um, some, some challenges ahead and some, some increased cost for fertilizer. Looking at interest rates we know that commercial banks have been told to prepare for negative interest rates while if you're looking to invest that could well be a positive thing because it'll reduce the cost of borrowing uh, it also reduces the value of cash in the bank while we're not going to see a huge swing in interest rates it's not like we're going to go from the 0.1 percent that we're at at the moment down to a minus 10 percent um, it's certainly enough to to make a noticeable impact it does increase the incentive to, to store grain through the season somewhat. The opportunity cost of having cash in the bank is obviously going to reduce. And we've already heard that with um, bioethanol demand potentially up next year and Vivergo coming back online from the beginning of 2022, there could well be a strong incentive to carry grain into the second half of the season. Um, and negative interest rates will obviously help to incentivize that carry into the latter half of the year. On the other side of that, a negative interest rate will also drive a reduced exchange rate, all other things being equal. Uh, it'll obviously depend on the relative interest rates in other countries, um, but a lower interest rate in the UK certainly reduces the incentive for foreign investment in UK priced uh, derivatives because there is there's less savings to be or less money to be gained from, from holding savings. Um, so that's something certainly to, to watch out for. Obviously, if we see a, a reduced exchange rate, then we will also see a little bit more um, price support for, for UK grains and oil seeds. We've had a bit of a look ahead to um, what the cost and price picture may also look like for the 2022-23 season. So we're jumping uh, another season forward to the harvest after this one. Um, obviously, we, we only have limited uh, data at the moment, and it's very much based on um, estimates and averages, but we can see that um, there's still going to be a very strong incentive for wheat, as there always is in these margin calculations. Um, but there's some changes in other areas. We're seeing the incentive potentially to grow rapeseed reduce slightly. Um, down two positions and that arguably also doesn't reflect the the true cost that we're seeing to grow rapeseed at the moment particularly with the challenges um, with cabbage stem flea beetle the costs going into that particularly for, for plant protection likely to be significantly higher than than we can really estimate at present with that in mind it's important for us to start having a bit of a think about some um, alternative crops that are out there and some alternative break crops uh, and we're certainly seeing that some of the spring cropping options while they may not have the most attractive um, margin overall gross margin in the world the output per, per pound of variable cost spent for those spring crops is certainly higher and we'll, we'll touch on it later but as we move into a period of uh, potentially higher prices and, and stronger costs keeping an eye on costs and growing crops that have a good return 
um, on investment is certainly going to be something that, that we need to look at. I'll now hand over to Vicky, who will talk a bit about some of the policy changes that are in the pipeline. Thank you, James. Yeah. So as James and Alex have just gone over the what could the outlook could be for the, the short term ahead, it just seems prudent as well to focus on what might we see the longer term down the road and like what life might look like after the basic payment scheme. Now, common knowledge, we all know the basic payment scheme is being phased out, but I thought it was actually quite prudent to flag what support the basic payment scheme has given Ar the arable business and arable businesses over the past five years. So typically the basic payment scheme has been between 55 to 85 percent of total farm business income over that time. So it's been a real crux and a real support to the industry and it's going to be phased out. We know that by 2028 there's going to be no basic payment scheme payments. The table on the right hand side just showing what that reduction could look like depending on what payment band you're sitting in. So we're losing basic payment scheme, we're losing that support, but we know it's being being replaced and it's being replaced with, with ELMS. This has been well documented. So ELMS, what do we know about it at the moment? Well, it's currently trialling. Um, it's trialling from this year through to 2024, the sustainable farming initiative element of it looking to launch in late 2024, depending on the outcome of these trials. It's also going to form, it's got three arms that it forms at the moment. So the Sustainable Farming Initiative, which I've just mentioned, also the local nature recovery and the landscape recovery elements of the scheme as well. And the elements of those will be being trialled later on this decade, so 24, 25 onwards for uh, implementation once the basic payment scheme has been removed in 2028. I think what we also need to flag here as well is what other considerations are coming down the road in conjunction with ELMS. So we've got the much lauded net zero targets from the government. Um, obviously we have um, international meetings at the end of this year as well, where these are going to be discussed and targets are going to be um, reached and arranged between ourselves and other nations but essentially agriculture is going to form a big part of these net zero targets and what the schemes and initiatives might be in place to try and reach these. Equally we've got the 30 by 30 initiatives so 30 percent of UK lands um, to be returned to its natural biodiversity by 2030 and again we understand and we know what a key part agriculture is going to play in that, uh, we don't net yet know what that part may look like. So that is something that we will flag AHDB, we will share with you, and of course, much of the industry with as well. So please keep reading and keep um, touching base with all sources to see what they could look like also. There's been a couple of consultations that have just closed, one at the end of January, one at the end of February, one around ammonia emissions and the second one being the National Action Plan for pesticide usage. So the ammonia emissions, we have you know, the industry has been targeted with reducing ammonia emissions, how we can do this. Like I say, the consultation has just closed on that. So we'll be hearing later this year of what that might look like, but there might be some additional cost, um, but some additional opportunity that may come with the industry as well. The uh, Pesticide Usage Action Plan, this is looking to replace the current plan that was launched in 2013. Um, and again, the consultation is just shut on that. So we'll be expecting to hear what that might look like later on in the year. Obviously, we know with um, neonicotinoids and how that has been removed from our toolkit and impact that has had with cabbage stem flea vehicle and oilseed rates. So, again, this is something key to the industry and key that we, we must, must watch out for. And finally, I just wanted to flag that the second part of the national food strategy is being launched at the end of this year. Um, and agriculture, again, is going to play a key part of this. We have from farm to fork, key part of the supply chain. So again, please keep a watching brief of what impact that might have good to the industry and especially the arable industry. So with that in mind and thinking about what James and what Alex have flagged and shared with us today, we look like we're going to be moving towards a high price, but a high cost year. So I think the key thing is for me, James, key thing is for me, Alex, what do we need to be considering when when we're marketing our grain? Um, yeah, I can I can take this one. Um, yep. 
the biggest one is kind of that risk management side of it. Um, it's it's different for each farm business and entirely kind of depends on your risk appetite of, of you, the seller. Um, there's no absolute right or wrong in grain marketing. Um, every farm business is different, both in location, marketing feel, feelings towards marketing strategy as well. Um, a farm in South of England will have different end markets with potentially different quality parameters as well to a farm business in um, on the Scottish borders really. So having that kind of sound marketing plan is key um, with the upcoming challenges that UK agriculture is facing in the next five years, as we spoke about, and just kind of making sure to know the different options in the homes that your crop has, has access to, especially if uh, potentially desired quality levels are not achieved. I mean, selling rejected milling quality grain as, as feed to your neighbor down the road is, is fine, but could that go into another market for potentially a better margin maybe? Um, Another another choice of risk management is the idea of options contracts as well. And these kind of enable the owner to hedge against potential market movements with the use of call and put options. Um, however, you need to make sure that you have this prior knowledge and the research rather than just kind of diving headfirst into it. I, I know, James, you've kind of looked at these in, de uh, in detail. Um, if you want to kind of um, explain these a little bit better. Yeah, so uh, like say, the, the key thing um, really is going to be understanding understanding your risk appetite and um depending on on what percentage you've you've already sold forward um it could well be that the options uh could be the thing to look at and like i said it depends very much on your view of the market if you think the market's uh, likely to to be rising um then then a call option is very much something you could you could look at and and put options if you think there there may be a fall in the market um on the flip side of that you have to say that the, the new crop prices, particularly as we look forward to the May 22 contract, are, are very attractive at the moment. Um, and even using a put option, you, you can almost use that to guarantee yourself a minimum price um, for, for a small expenditure and then look to the market to, to make gains above it. So it's slightly alternative to the, to the way that it would normally be viewed, but it's certainly um, an option that there is. In terms of um, what else is going to be really important as we look towards uh, next season? I really think cost management is going to be going to be absolutely huge in understanding your cost of production. Um, you know, unless you understand how much it's costing you to grow something, then you're never going to know if uh, you're, you're achieving a good price or not. At the moment, with with wheat prices at at two hundred pounds per ton, arguably your your cost management is it's obviously always important, but it's less important because it's, it's very difficult to, to get that marketing decision wrong at £200 a tonne. Um, it, it's when we start to go into that high price, high cost year that understanding cost of production and, and managing your cost of production is going to be going to be hugely important. Um, you also mentioned the, the need to, to understand, Alex, what homes are around you. Um, for me, as we start to move towards increased control over um emissions and an increased focus on the environment knowing what homes are available to you and whether you're in the, the best place to be to be growing milling wheat for example you know a high nitrogen nitrogen intense crop if you're going to be um focused on on any emissions that are coming out as a result if you're two three hundred miles away from a mill then that certainly won't be the best thing for you to be doing um if there are, are other options nearer to you um Obviously, that's that's a bit of the the environmental picture there, uh, Meg. I, I know you've had a look at the um, the policy side quite a bit recently. I don't know if you want to maybe give us a bit more detail on uh, what we know so far about the environmental land management scheme. Yeah. So as we discussed with the transition away from the basic payment scheme, um, it's really important to understand your costs, um, but also your opportunities for the future and what's going to work best for you. So in terms of priority for funding, uh, the new ELM schemes, as Vicky said, um, are starting up and are designed to say so there's no set end dates at the moment. It's split into three outcomes. So we've got the sustainable farming incentive, the local nature recovery and the landscape recovery. So the first to pilot is a sustainable farming incentive. And what's really great about this is it's flexible. So you can choose from the eight standards, build your own agreements, um, for example, around integrated pest management or water management. Um, it's really flexible, so it can help you um, to suit you and your farm. 
the landscape recovery and the local nature schemes are more about blending public and private funding together for a more collaborative approach um, in it, our communities. And there's some really great opportunities here too, and those pilots are to start from 2022 around. Um, but unlike direct payments, these schemes are designed to be paid on outcomes and results um, and the public goods that we hear so much about. And there will be work in achieving these. The testing trials are ongoing at the moment. They're working on um, how participants might be paid. So let's talk about a points-based system or a results-based system. And this would really mean monitoring your own results. Um, so really thinking back to basics, the biggest thing to consider is are these new schemes right for you? Um, think about your business. Where do you see yourself in five, ten years? And what personally would you would you like to achieve? There are some really great opportunities with these new schemes, um, and there is the flexibility to make them suit you. But understanding where your focus is going to be uh, is definitely the first step to getting there. So I think in the interest of time, um, we'll just pull forward and, and summarise the conversations we've had over the past 15, 20 minutes. So as Alex and as James showed, uh, we've got a potential for high prices and high costs moving into the next marketing year. So this really increases the need to focus on our cost of production in our marketing plan. Um, and here we have tools such as the AHDB Farm Bench that can help you. Um, other tools are available, but if you've not seen Farm Bench already, I'd urge you to go onto the website and look for it and, and have a route through. Um, also, there's an incentive to store. Um, it's increased marginally, um, so we need to consider what tools might be available to help us manage that risk as well. Um, and then finally, we've got this shift away from the basic payment scheme, and the top and tail of it is this will impact the bottom line. Um, so we need to look at the other options in ELMS, which Megan's just um, described a few of them, and consider the impact of the other policy shifts that could come on the horizon as well, the ammonia emissions, national food uh, strategy, and the pesticide plan, to name just a few. So I'll draw this session to a close then in the interest of time, um, and I'd like to open the virtual floor for any questions we may have, please. Cheers, guys. Um, again, that was really useful, and we've had some really good questions that have come through as you've been um, talking through that detail, of which I'll go through a few now. Um, James, it's okay to come to you first regarding the margins and gross margins that you've put up. I've um, got a question from um, Susie Horn, who's asking regarding the um, new entry of winter linseed um, into the fifth place on the rankings. Um, are we taking into account the harvest risk element um, in these figures? Because we know that linseed is notoriously a tricky crop to harvest. Yeah, so it's obviously difficult to, to factor that in entirely. Um, and it it's going to be very much dependent, I guess, on what desiccants are available as we, we move through to harvest. Um, I think something we also need to consider, particularly around some of the newer crops um, that we've started to add into those margins, is that they are relatively small markets. And when you've got relatively small markets, the, the chance to erode that price or the, the challenge of eroding that price is, is quite big when you start to see large increases in area. Um, so particularly with some of the, the more niche crops, um, contracts are going to be really important, but it's hard to, to price, just going back to the question, hard to price that, that harvest risk into a, an economic margin. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's just one of those um, key pieces of information that needs to come into mind, isn't it, when you're weighing it up across the, the whole sort of agronomic mm -hmm. and farm perspective. Um, so I've got another um, really interesting question that's come through, um, again, from... Um, Pete Collins. So thanks, Pete. I'll come to you on this one, Alex. Um, you sort of mentioned um, oilseed rape and the risk of cabbage and flea beetle, etc. Uh, and Pete's asking um, regarding um, crushing capacity and oilseed rape production that we've seen crushing capacity stay high and production has been on a downward trend. Um, and he asks, will the UK ever be a rapeseed exporter ever again? Um, that's kind of a crystal ball question really um i think it's got it's got the potential there but it entirely depends on this kind of cabbage stem flea beetle problem because we've seen year on year almost that this rapeseed area has been declining because um growers have been struggling to kind of to beat this cabbage stem flea beetle um it, it's 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 really increasing the risk of growing the crop i mean we've seen 
farmers plant it in winter and then come the spring the, the, the field has kind of been ravished and they're having to rip up the field and plant something else because the risk is um, it just won't make that kind of that final yield um, so becoming a net exporter it, it entirely depends on if we can kind of get over this hurdle of, of um, being able to kind of grow a rapeseed crop without the fear of it kind of um, not getting to the end of harvest really I think for me just kind of add into that um, it's very much going to depend on what the crushing capacity looks like in the UK over the longer term um, particularly where we've got a lot of big corporation or two primary big corporation crushers um, if we're starting to produce smaller crops it depends if it's economic for those plants to to remain crushing in the UK if we were to see those plants go and you take out one one and a half million tons of demand then it's it's very easy to swing to to being a net exporter of rapeseed because our crushing capacity is reduced in the uk great thanks for that guys um and i suppose a bit of a, a question to, to all of you and um you know we, we've still got helen and um, tom and anthony on the line so if any of you guys want to dive in for any of these questions then feel free to um get your elbows out and, and butt in don't worry we won't be offended um but the question um from uh, tim porter this is one that was carried over from the first session actually but probably slightly more appropriate now at the end and we've discussed everything but regarding an appreciating sterling um does this help or hinder the uk cereal and oil seed producer especially when harvest 21 looks to be a deficit production year Is anyone I, I can uh, I can go in there um, so I mean from a um, UK perspective obviously um, it, it's going to be pressurizing towards towards UK prices um, but equally uh, if we've got an appreciating sterling then it, it becomes more challenging for for the countries that well, it becomes cheaper to import essentially so um, there from a UK farmer's perspective, it's going to put some pressure on prices, but we have to bear in mind, obviously, like I mentioned, the interest rate and, and whether that puts some additional pressure onto exchange rates. I guess the flip side of that argument from a UK grower's perspective is if we're importing any of the inputs, then it's also going to pressure those prices. So while it may pressure the, the prices of your outputs, it also has the capacity to pressure the prices of your inputs and probably leave you in a, a net neutral position compared to where you were previously. Cool, thanks James. Um, it's been a question come through from um, from Jonathan Arnold um, asking um, that uh, great efforts are made by growers to take samples as produce goes into store, um, which are much more accurate. Um, can HDB do any more to help growers get a better handle on what exactly is in store and how to maintain quality in store? Um, we do produce a grain storage guide which i've added into the chat here so everyone can see that and we're also in um, discussions at the moment um as to how we can adapt that and improve that and that will actually be something that will be updated um this year later on this year to try and get something out for harvest so um if anyone has any feedback on that that what we should be including and what we should be changing with it then we're all ears but i would suggest to um take a look through the grain storage guide that i've just put in the chat there and then come back with any feedback because again we'd find that um, really useful um uh, I've got another um, couple of questions. I'm kind of again grouping these together and probably more aimed at um, Megan and, and Vicky from the conversation you were having regarding um, the you know, moves to elms and um, new systems. But the question is asking that um, is there a risk that if the, the new um, support systems and mechanisms that are put in place are um, too much of an incentive, um, could that potentially take productive land? Out of uh, out of the UK and actually harm um, grain and oilseed production domestically. Yep, well, I'm happy to take that one. Um, so, in terms of where we're at at the moment, the tests and trials are ongoing. They're going to decide how participants participants are going to be paid. Um, and the government do want high levels of participation to reach their goals. But in terms of my um, understanding of the Sustainable Farming Initiative incentive, the outcome is to work hand in hand with productive farms to meet certain goals so whether that is through integrated pest management water management um, in terms of the landscape recovery and local nature schemes they're more about enhancing peatland areas salt marshes 
So more of a collaborative approach on those sort of areas and a collective response to, to reaching those aims. But certainly I think this, with this new funding coming in, um, it's a chance to go back, look at your costings, gross margins, are things working for you now? Um, is your business sustainable? Are you happy with the way, the way that it's going? because these new schemes do offer opportunities um i mean at the moment there's certainly those opportunities available to you so it's just looking through a lens of risk versus reward where do you see yourself and and what would you like to achieve and i think to, to add to that there's the argument isn't there that this is going to incentivize less productive land to be taken out which you know this is always good um and us really allows uh, the industry to focus on increasing productivity on the productive land um which can only be good for everyone great thanks guys um if i may uh, could i please request that toma join back onto the call please because we've had a couple of questions um regarding the balance sheet information that we produce that we sort of uh, mentioned earlier um and, and the first of those is um uh, again i'm kind of grouping a couple of questions together here sort of to, to get the theme and the topic out um but the the overall questions are how how reliable are the um are the data and how reliable are the figures that um, are being produced in the balance sheet Fair. I think that is a fair question, David. And there are question marks over some of the figures that do go into publishing the balance sheet. Um, from our point of view, the uh, figures that we feed in, so that's the Merchant Ports and Co-ops stock survey and the monthly usage survey, we think they're pretty faultless. I mean, nothing's perfect, but we have got a lot of faith in those figures that go into the balance sheet. Where we question it is probably the figures that we get from DEFRA. So I'm talking about our production figures often has question marks and also the on farm cereal stock survey. The one that was done in June and therefore fed into our ending stocks figure had a confidence interval of 50 percent, which isn't great. But what we're doing is we're really working with DEFRA and trying to come up with ways to rectify this and make it as reliable as possible. What we have to say is that it's the best information we've got at the time and the industry has to decide whether they would rather a balance sheet with some question marks over it or no balance sheet at all. But what we're doing with DEFRA is they have doubled their uh, on-farm cereal stocks survey sample. So that's gone from 2000 to 4000. So with a bigger survey sample obviously becomes greater reliability. Uh, looking slightly further down the line, we're in discussions with them as to how we could use some uh, satellite data to get a more reliable area figure and therefore a better production figure. And then a little more longer term, we're obviously in the process of trying to produce these e-grain passports. And that is just going to enable much greater transparency through whole, through all the, throughout the whole supply chain. So, yeah, we're working to increase reliability. Great, thanks, Toma. Um, I've got another um, question that's um, come through um, a, a few minutes ago. That's really interesting. Probably one that's more pointed towards um, James and, and Alex for some of the conversations you were having regarding marketing strategies. Um, and it's asking, um, what is our view on the best derivative to use linked to um, London Feed Week's futures? Um, liquidity is so poor on London futures and um, surely futures are a safer bet than options as they don't experience the premium decay. So I guess, you know, what, what other um, derivatives are there out there that could be used? And I suppose it's a bit of a question of the, the pros and cons of um, futures versus um, options. Um, I guess with the, the advantage of a futures market is that they can be traded anywhere globally. So it wouldn't necessarily have to be the case that you'd have to trade UK wheat futures if they've got low liquidity. So there would be options out there to, to look at Paris milling wheat futures, which have got a much higher liquidity or something like cash settled Chicago futures. Um, if options and uh, futures trading was to form part of your marketing strategy, there are, you don't, you're not limited just to, to using, um, UK feed wheat. I would say that um, the if we're talking about UK feed wheat futures and, and low liquidity, and therefore um, not wanting to trade them because they have low, it's, it's sort of a never-ending cycle, um, and that in itself creates a market risk for price transparency overall. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it's a a real challenge because 
they need to be traded so that we've got the transparency in the market. But equally, um, I think a prime example would be something like the, uh, if, if we look far further forward, so say the November 22 contract, where there's really low volume on it at the moment, it's really hard to gauge a price for that, that new crop. So it's probably just as important to understand what our relationship is historically to some of the other futures markets as well. Great, cheers guys. Um, again, um, Tom, I'm coming back to you um, just on the balance sheet topic again. There's been another couple of questions that have come through um, sort of following on um, some uh, questions about the move from a um, deficit to a surplus. Uh, and I think again, kind of framing those as a sort of theme, I guess it's just a question of um, uh, how did we move from a deficit to a surplus and what do you think that means for the for the rest of this season? Yeah, so obviously we've moved from a deficit to a surplus in a relatively short space of time. But what I'd say is with the February estimate, we have had six months of actual data that's fed into that. So half the season, we know that these are the facts. And that's also provided us a better basis to then work our assumptions for the second half of the season. Um, we speak to industry all the time and we're being told time and time again by the uh, compounders that they're just on barley, barley, barley. This may, wheat just isn't featuring. And so that has enabled us to kill a lot of wheat demand from that respect. And then, as I mentioned earlier, with the milling uh, sector, that this third lockdown's probably been the most detrimental out of all three lockdowns when it comes to demand. And we obviously know that there was a big chunk of wheat imported prior to the EU exit deadline. And really, they're just slowly working their way through this lump of imported that sat in store. And not much uh, homegrown wheat has really featured in the grist compared to what we maybe thought back in November. Um, and then we've also obviously in a much better situation with Brexit. In November, we didn't know what was going to happen with trade, what tariffs we might be subjected to. Um, we just didn't know it was that ever those question marks over everything. So I'd just say that three months down the line, we just have a much clearer picture of not only what has happened in the first half of the season, but what is also likely to happen in the second half of the season. And I think that it's just feeling overall not as tight as we were probably worried about at the beginning of the season. And I think the milling industry thinks they've probably done enough now just about get them to the end of the season. But because they have done well importing, you've got some low quality maybe soft, low protein, hards, which might have gone for milling, but aren't needed. So they've then been dumped on the feed heap and that's then filled a hole in the feed heap. So yeah, I think, as I said earlier, the market's done its job and we should just about get there. Great, thanks, Toma. Um, there's been a couple of questions that have come through um, regarding um, barley replacing wheat in the rations. Um, we've had a couple from um, Nick Matthews on this, so maybe we could just go in that a little bit more detail there, because you mentioned um, the, the market's kind of doing its job, and at the moment um, Nick's suggesting that there's still a, a relatively large discount for um, barley in July and even into August with harvest as well. So I guess, you know, this is kind of an open question to anyone that wants to, to take it on, but how do you see that um, barley and wheat relationship playing out um, from now, um, I think earlier um, you mentioned, Toma, that there's a much smaller discount in September onwards. Um, but how do we see that discount playing out sort of later in the season and sort of through the, the early um, harvest period? Don't all work at once. I can start off there. I think probably barley is beginning to feel a bit tighter than maybe we originally thought. And I guess a lot of this is that. Um, Obviously, a lot of demands moved from wheat to barley. At a £40 discount, it is still going to keep being included. And the compounders, actually, I think where they have been using so much of it, they've realised they can actually get away with using a higher percentage in the ration. So I think we'll still continue to see quite a lot of barley used for this season. And I've even heard a couple say that going forward, because it is working so well at higher levels, it probably will be included in the future. I think it's probably going to depend very much on on which diets we're looking at as well. Um, so as we start to move towards the end of the season, we'll lose some of the uh, ruminant diets from the mix. So we potentially lose some some barley demand there as we see turnout of of livestock. Um, 
it's probably not as as high in the poultry diet but it's definitely not as high in the poultry diet as it is in in other diets so um as we start to move into those summer months we will see a bit of a change in the pattern of the diets which are being served so i think that that could well have an impact but like you say someone with barley at a heavy discount then it's certainly probably there to stay in in the short to medium term great thanks guys um so we're kind of reaching uh, an end now so i just before i sort of wrapped up i just wanted to see if anyone had any other sort of further questions that come through or if any of you guys wanted to make any further comments on anything else that you think we've um forgotten about that we should have mentioned before we finish up any other final comments to make not from me great okay well thank you all um so much for, for your time and taking part thank you for all your hard work and putting all this information together and um, so that's all we have time for today and um, thank you for everyone who's participated and thank you for all, all of the people that we have um watching and uh to go through such a, a comprehensive view of what's happening on a world market and domestically and looking at it from a, a business planning point of view as well so we've heard how stocks around the world and in the uk are going to become um, tight this season and it's been driven globally by this big chinese demand that we expect to continue for the rest of this season and likely for the rest of this year as well and unless we see some really huge crops from Harvest 21, then prices do look supported for the long term. And we're already seeing that uncertainty from the things that um, Anthony was mentioning earlier regarding winter keel in the US and Russia. It's already putting a question mark over that supply response. Uh, and then, we're, as we've heard in the second half of um, the session, high prices aren't a guarantee for profit. And we have high costs with fertilizer prices steadily rising and likely to stay firm if agricultural commodities stay firm in the coming months as well and then as Vicky and Megan mentioned the changing picture of direct payments and subsidies and the question of how to build a, a grain marketing plan to cover both high prices high costs and also factor in the changes to subsidy as well and I think that's our, our key message from today and a key message that we've been promoting from a lot of things is to look at how you can protect those new crop and, and new new crop profit margins understanding your cost of production by using tools such as um, AHDB's farm bench tool and then using the market information that the team produce um, to understand the, the longer term direction in prices um, and as direct subsidies reduce and new support mechanisms come into play that volatility of world markets will have an increasing impact on our businesses bottom line so our counsel is to look to the future and think 12 months ahead for how your crops are growing now and, and how that will be your cash flow so again i just want to say thank you all for for taking part thank you for all our speakers for giving your your time and your knowledge today um, it's been really useful and really interesting and just to remind all of the people that we have watching and participating that um, when the webinar finishes you will be asked to provide some feedback as i said at the start it only takes a, a minute of your time but it is hugely valuable for the work that we do that we can understand exactly what you guys want and how we can um, provide a, a greater value from your levy so I'll bring it to a close there. Thank you all much for your for your time and participation and um, hopefully we'll speak to you all again very soon. Thank you.